Welcome to Wisdom Exchange TV. My name is Suzanne F. Stevens, Chief Edge Optimizer for the Ignite Excellence Group of Initiatives. One of our key initiatives is the Ignite Excellence Foundation, where we invest, inspire, and develop future women leaders in developing countries. With that goal in mind, we produce Wisdom Exchange TV, which is a resource for African women and men to learn from change agents in politics, business, philanthropy, and education. These women will provide insights and strategies in their area of expertise, as well as leadership lessons for all of us to learn and be inspired by. Please join us on Facebook fan page at wisdomexchangetv.com to learn who's coming up next or to suggest who you would like to see interviewed. Today, we are in Kigali, Rwanda with a leading lady in business. We are with Antonia Matoro, Executive Director for the Institute of Policy and Analysis and Research in Rwanda, IPR Rwanda. Starting as a teacher and now sits at the top perch of the country's most eminent research institution, Antonia is the first and current Executive Director of the Institution of Policy Analysis and Research in Rwanda and the first Rwandan independent think tank, which became operational in 2008. She played a key role in setting up and driving its strategic direction, and IPAR has quickly earned a reputation as a credible source of policy and influence in Rwanda. Something else very special about this woman is she put IPAR on the map, and it's always good to meet somebody who comes in as an executive and puts something on the map. So it's absolute pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Now, you know, this is a, I would imagine, a little bit of a career switch for you because you were teaching as an academic senior manager in higher education at Kigali Institution of Science and Technology, correct? Yes. Now, why did you decide to change your career? That's a very good question, an important question for me. I was doing uh, management and leadership and research, but I had passionate for things that work. I really wanted to see change. And in an academic institution, uh, the research that is done there does not directly make change. So I wanted like, to join somewhere where research is done and then is directly taken to people who implement it and ha have a say, you know, this is the research, please use it. So it was because of the passion to make my work used. So that's really why I, I, I thought I should leave an academic institution and go for a policy research institution because I knew things would directly work and be used and also learn you know, new challenges. What you're talking about is the research that you use, that you do, is being used. What would you say one of the biggest pieces of research that you've done to date that have had an impact on Rwanda? Quite a number of uh, our products have actually tried to change the thinking and mind state of Rwandans. We did uh, a study on uh, customer service delivery, and this has guided some thinking and direction in improving customer service in Rwanda. It has been discussed in many high forums, including the national retreats, that is chaired by His Excellency the President. It's being now implemented by Rwanda Development Board. And so a lot is being done on customer service in Rwanda as a result of our policy recommendations. That's so good to hear. I, you know, I'm a big customer service fan. <laughs> so it's good to hear, and I've heard in a recent other interview about how important the tourism industry yes. is. Yes. And therefore, yes. you, you complement a previous interview very exactly. nicely, actually. Exactly. Now, you, you played a key role in setting up and driving the strategic direction of IPR. Can you provide us with a list of strategies that you employ to acquire the good reputation it has today? When I took this responsibility, I knew uh, there were issues and you know challenges in the past. So the first thing was to have IPAR's visibility you know, known. So we decided first to, you know, go out there and talk to key people. We did a scanning of our environment 
So we looked at civil society organizations in Rwanda, at government institutions in Rwanda, private sector, donors, and visited them and told us, told them about ourselves, what we are doing, what we are there to do, and how we can work with them, and what we bring to them. And we built relationships, and we kept communicating with them. There, we maintain up to now, we've been, we maintain the relationship. So that was one, the first strategy. The second strategy was to conduct high quality, relevant research. So the research we do is informed by the needs of the Rwandan society. We consult, but we remain independent in terms of our recommendation. But isolation does not work at all. You need to really consult and talk to people for whom you're doing research for, or who, who you think are going to implement this research. So the second is engagement, consultation, rather than isolation. Some people make a mistake and say an independent think tank should work independently. Independence means just independence in terms of academic rigor, in terms of uh, the recommendations that you get from the research, but it does not mean working alone you know, consultation and engagement is key, and building relationship. That's the tip. The third, the, uh, the third is really making sure that you recruit high quality researchers. And if you can't find them, because they, this, it's a real challenge in this country that we lack a critical mass of researchers, go out there, find everywhere in the world, make your institute attractive, and Get also the young, inexperienced, promising ones and nurture them. And that's what we are doing there. We attract them and try to build their capacity using experienced researchers that we get from the region and beyond. And so I think those are the main strategies. Once you uh, produce high quality researchers, you become credible and credibility is the key to success. So right now we are getting lots of stakeholders from government, from donors, from our, you know, civil society coming to us, requesting us to do work for them and to provide evidence for which they want to make, you know, political decisions, economic decisions, and, and that kind of thing. I just want to get some clarity on your first strategy, the going out and talking to people. Were you, you mentioned that you were telling them about what you were doing. Were you also soliciting where they saw the opportunity to work together? Yes. You cannot work if, with people who don't know you. You need to say, I'm here. This is my goal. This is my vision. And this is what I work on. Is there any relevance between your institution and IPA? And how can we work together? What value can we add for you? What value can you add for us? So it's kind of creating a relationship with World Bank, with government, with civil society organizations. Now, how many of those people, let's say in the first year that you headed out to have those kind of conversations, how many of them became clients? All of them. <laughs> well done. All of them. Okay, and, and why, why All of them. bringing, sort of highlighting this? Yes. Is, like in any leadership, leadership or in business development, there's, it's, there's a similarity yes. that learning Going and having those conversations, yes. not necessarily always pitching to win the business, yeah. but just saying, okay, I'm going to learn about you and see if there's an opportunity. Maybe yeah. there is or there isn't an opportunity, yeah. so yeah. be it. But at least you know we exist, I know you exist, yeah. and having those conversations. Yeah. Very strategic. Yeah. Very strategic. Yeah, yeah. It, it's the importance of this is that we knew organizations that were policy relevant. Mm -hmm. So we went to all those. We went to 66. Uh, organizations in this country that were policy relevant. Either they do, they, they, they implement policies or they have a say on policies or you know they are working for poverty reduction and all that. So we knew there was some relationship but they did not know us. They did not know our potential. They did not know that we exist. So after that you know things changed. Now I, I've read that IPR believes that economic growth and development is impossible without sound policy, 
responsive governance, you seek to strengthen the evidence based available to government, civil society, and development partners about the pressing social, economic, and political issues facing Rwanda to provide real-time solutions to the everyday challenges of its people. Now, I believe you probably said that. <laughs> um, now, I understand customer service was one of those things, yeah. but could you tell us, uh, give us some other examples? One of the other we are proud of is the uh, household enterprises study. You know, uh, the government has a policy on employment, which is great. It has a policy on small and medium enterprises, the growth and support for small and medium enterprises, but there was no uh, kind of linking small and medium enterprises with household enterprises. The majority of Rwandans are poor, you know, under the poverty line, but there's a lot happening now. You know, things are improving, people are becoming better off, but still, people are still poor. And so, when you're doing a strategy to get people out of poverty, and uh, you forget the household level, and you look at small, medium enterprises. Small enterprises are people who actually can set up a small shop, who can, you know, have something, you know, to talk about. But there are these people who don't have anything, or probably they, they only earn a living because of, um, say, riding a motorbike, or, you know, having just something to live on. And those uh, create small enterprises at household level. These enterprises probably, you know, it's the wife that is working in, or the husband, or the child, who is not paid. So the majority of Rwandans are, are getting more and more jobs on household. And then our study identified that actually, if investors, if the government, and if NGOs can support household level businesses and enterprises, Rwanda would get out of poverty much quicker than, you know, doing anything else without forgetting also keeping supporting small and medium enterprises. But the household levels which are lower than small, you know, uh, should not be ignored. And that's something that has been realized and, you know, things that now, you know, everybody is talking about supporting household enterprises because of, our, of, of, of the, you know, the recommendations of our research. We also think that's a major, major thing because the policy was there, but nobody seemed to realize that actually, you know, small and medium enterprises are there, but something smaller than small were there, and that's where the majority of the poor Rwandans were, and they needed to be uplifted, especially the youth and the women lie in that category. Mm -hmm. and, and so our research is having impact because the policy is being revised. A lot is being talked about, you know, helping household enterprises. Now I've had the pleasure of working with research organizations in uh, Canada and US. And a matter of fact, use research in a lot of the work I do. Yeah. And some organizations provide information and allow the client to make the recommendation. And some organizations do the research and also make the recommendation. Yeah. Which are you? We do both. What we do is uh, we engage, as I tell you from the start, when we are conceiving a problem, we just go to the person who's supposed to implement and say, look here, we identify this as an issue. We're going to do research on this. Sometimes, actually, the client gets excited and says, okay, we are co-funding it because this is an issue, you know. Like the one of, 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 um, of uh, customer service. We come up with the idea and RDB, you know, said, okay, that's great. We actually wanted a consultant to do this. RDB is? Rwanda Development Board. I just want to make sure for yeah. everybody knows. Yeah. Great. So, um, after that, we do a position paper. A position paper is a paper we write after looking at the policies, practices in place here. Yeah. And then we call all the stakeholders, all the clients, all the people who are affected or affect the area we are studying, you know, in, in a meeting or in a workshop and say, this is what we found, okay? 
anything to add or anything to remove. Are we right? They will say, okay, I think there you should do this. So participatory. That is called the position paper. Once, we, you know, so after the position paper, we now go to the field and start questioning. And then after the question, plus the position paper, we disseminate, you know, the work again and, you know, say these are our findings. Do they match uh, the things we thought about, the issues you talked about when we accepted the position paper? They say, okay, I think this. Sometimes um, they agree, sometimes they don't agree. But because of the findings, you know, because of the findings, you know, especially sometimes that things are supposed to be implemented at certain levels and probably you interviewed other people at certain levels. So uh, whether they agree or not, once we know that actually our findings are high quality, we don't change. So they take what are in, they think they can, they can take. With that, the, the ability from a recommendation perspective, what recommendations would you give to organizations if they're trying to maybe pursue a new market, launch a new product, look at look at their, their doing some market analysis, what process do they need to take to implement understanding their state, their stakeholders? One of the challenges uh, with us think tanks or research organizations is that we are detached uh, from the people we work for. So you, you just think you know it all and you do your research and you just provide here you are implement and they even don't know what, how to implement. So the best thing to do is to engage, but also uh, make sure Should that they, they engage with you. Is that what you mean? Do no, you no, mean? no. They engage with the with the clients, right? And make sure the client understands the whole process and buys in and owns the process of research as well. And you know. You shouldn't wait to come up with recommendations with a big bang. No. You know, it's a process, step by step. Are we together? Are we tra travel and work with your clients on the things you're doing so that when you come up with recommendations, they are not a surprise. Sometimes the, the, the recommendations seem not, seem to surprise the client. So it's not good to surprise. Take them step by step, step by step. And the recommendations must be implementable. So think of options. Option A, it may not work because it's very expensive. Option B, uh, is, is, may work, but it's not politically correct. Uh, option C is, is a little bit simpler and cheaper and good, but it may take long. So you just talk with them, you know, what best options? They are the people to implement, so you need to buy in their ideas. So the, I think the issue is communication, engagement, and also when you're talking to them or writing policy recommendations, they should be reader friendly. They should be uh, they should be in a language that everybody understands, that policymakers understand, that uh, you know layman layman you know understands. Don't talk in very academic language, research language. Nobody's interested. One of the things I was thinking is too, from a business perspective, regardless of research, everything yeah. you said is actually relevant. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I like communication. We hear communication all the time. As, as an expert in communication, when someone says we have to communicate, I always say, of course. It's how you communicate. Yeah. But what I liked, you know, what you were talking about is don't surprise them. Because I, I often look at it as control expectations too, yes, yes, you exactly. know, because expectations, exactly. when, when you're thinking you're going to get this yes. and you're only getting this, yes. you all of a sudden yes. have created conflict. Yeah. But not surprising is really powerful, yeah. but also to your point, communicate in a language that is simple. Yeah. And not demonstrating that you're smart. I know you're smart because I hired you. <laughs> so I not only are you smart, but I'm smart for hiring you. <laughs> so and so that those are really good points. Yeah. Now, because many of your recommendations are based on research findings, yes. how important does creativity play in making your recommendations to clients? It's very, very um, important because uh, you just need to make things different. 
Uh, for instance, do you know mystery shopping? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, you, you you can pretend you 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 are client and buy and sleep in a hotel and get to know. Actually, you go to three hotels, and get to know how you know there, and that's another way of you know finding out. It's it's not the no more major of doing research and write ups and interviewing people. You just go. You are a client. You sleep in a Serena hotel. You go to another hotel. You Do you need extra help? Because I could use a hotel, <laughs> and the Serena would be a nice place to stay. <laughs> so that, those kind yeah. of things, yeah. okay? Yeah. And and so you come up with exactly what you want without interviewing anybody. Those are things that actually you know should come up. You know, think about new ways of doing things, and you know things that don't use much money mm -hmm. and effort. But you know something new. So it's you know creative ways of getting the research, getting the information that you need. Not always using the exact same process, but yeah. mixing up the creativity from that perspective. Yeah. Now, do you have any recommendations how to balance creativity and evidence when making recommendations? All the time you do that research, I told you about say mystery shopping. Still, you'll do um, literature review what has been done elsewhere in the world, what has worked in Canada, what has worked in Uganda, what has, you know, and also have to mix with the interviewing people. So you don't, just don't do one, you mix all of them and make sure, you, you know, you have information that is really, really tangible and complementing each other. But also with the, the giving recommendations too, you made an earlier comment that I also think answers that as well where you have your ABC solutions. Yeah. So as a researcher, when you're de de delivering a recommendation to a client, yeah. do you always, by nature, have an ABC solution? Or do you, this is our only recommendation? Or how do you approach that? Sometimes we do, sometimes we do not. If we find that uh, it's easy, uh, you know, the recommendations are easily implementable, mm -hmm. you just provide uh, of course, the recommendations are informed by the people's opinions themselves, mm -hmm. and and then you uh, you can say here are the recommendations that came up. What do you think about them? And then they would say, okay, recommendation A will work, and we think there's no problem. Recommendation B, uh, can we break it into? Can you tell us actually who should do this? And there's, they always add something or subtract something, or to make them actually implement it better. Mm -hmm. So you don't prescribe. Mm -hmm. You know, you just recommend and say, this is what research say. what do you think? And then they say, that's great, or probably this should be like this. There, why don't, doesn't it, you know, can it, so you help them through this. So have you made any observations when you look around Rwanda, you know, things that women do well in executive roles or things that maybe they need to do in order to get... Great, great question. I think uh, women are great leaders, the way I look at They look at details. They build better relationships. Um, let me not be, get biased, but I think... Um, True researcher. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, I find it easy and I love engaging the people I work with. I feel there you know, are people to bring together. I care for them. I look at details. I know, you know there are issues and I understand. Um, so there's that looking into detail, caring, you know, understanding that employees need, need very, very much. A woman has, a, you know, does great there at the YC. One of the things that uh, the, the weak, one of the weaknesses I think is kind of engaging uh, after work, for example, you know, we we tend to you know work during work hours, during presentation, and then after work you're there going to look after your children and you know home and all that, and that you're missing very many things in the evening where you know people are meeting to be there, discuss with them. And mostly uh, in our culture, uh, women normally, uh, of course, I think it's, it's natural to, but you, uh, 
you, you're supposed to be there, you, you help your children, you cook, you look after family. And uh, most men, after work, they go for leisure, you know, meet other men, discuss politics, discuss issues, enjoy life. So a woman with a career uh, uh, like me should balance, you know, should balance a work life as well as home life, which is kind of challenging. So you're missing out, you know, something happening beyond working hours, which is a social kind of thing, but also you gain things to do with work. And I would say that's where the challenge is. We need to balance that kind of thing. So you think a lot of Rwandan women have that challenge? Yeah. What would have to change in order for that to get better balanced? Men have to understand also uh, that women in leadership positions uh, should uh, be able to, you know, to go out there, and I think they do. Uh, but women also need to get out themselves and, and, and you know, join. But still, they should be able to care for the home. So that's why I was saying the challenge is out there. So we need to change our mindset. Again, from your observations, beyond the family commitment, because we know that's, that, that's there, that you see that women do that probably could work for them or against them uh, in, in the business community. We need to take the opportunity here in Rwanda. For instance, I think our country is one of the best in terms of providing opportunity for women, you know, to come up. And I do not think that uh, we have all, you know, used that opportunity. There's a lot, you know, uh, that is being done on, on these policies. So I think we could be better in you know, a position to be more academics, uh, to join uh, in politics more than, than we're doing, to join research in that kind of thing. So I think uh, we need to come out and, and say, look here, we can do this. Uh, why not? Because it's really difficult, for example, to find women researchers, uh, women academics. It's, it's, so many uh, yeah, join other businesses, but in academic, in research, in higher education, going beyond uh, university level and becoming researchers is kind of difficult. So I, I would think that's what, what, what women should come for in Rwanda and, you know, get up. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's still a challenge. You know, it's interesting too because Rwanda, from a political standpoint, has the most women in politics yes. in the world. Yes. Are those the right people and the best people to be in those roles? And are they striving for more in those roles in politics or in business and anything? So I think your, your points are. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the government has really, really, uh, uh, you know, encouraging policies to pull up women. And, and join politics and join academics and yeah. but academic is still a challenge. Now I understand one of your goals too is to make sure you achieve financial independence even though you're not for profit, is that correct? We are not for profit, yeah. So we are going for we we want to have many, you know, like foundations or donors or and also you know more clients so that we don't rely on one or two. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when you rely on one or two, when they you know stop, then it's problematic. So when you have so many, that's what we call independence. Because you can use the funds to do something you want. So we, we, we are striving to have many more uh, donors, you know, many more you know grants, foundations, clients. Why do you need donors and grants when you have clients? That's a good question. Uh, we need, uh, you know, this, 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 this research thing is tricky. Uh, we have commissioned work, which is, we do for clients, okay? Say the government says do a thing, World Bank says do this for us. That means you are addressing a problem they have already identified. Okay, but when you have different donors, you know, which we call core funding, you use the funding 
to address a problem that nobody else has found, but you think. So that's more independence. You say, look here, I think we need to tackle this. The government has not seen this. The donors don't think it's a problem, yet we think it's a problem. The civil society think it's okay, yet it's a problem. Nobody's going to fund you for something they don't understand. So nobody's going to come with money and say, look, I think there are problems, find a problem, except core funding from different foundations and donors. So we use that money to do our own proactive, independent ideas that we think actually are addressing things they have not seen. While clients come with problems, they say, we think there's a problem there. Can we find out what the answer is? And that's also, I think, where creativity comes back. Yes. Is, is you're not only solving people's problems, but you're actually looking for opportunities where exactly. there's problems that they're creating a need that doesn't even exist yet. Exactly. People aren't aware of it. So how do you measure success? Wow. Red question for, we talk about this every day. How do we measure success? It's very difficult, actually challenging, to measure success in a think tank. Normally, success should be measured by whether the, uh, your, your, your ideas and recommendations have been implemented and change has happened in society. That's, that's when you measure success. Once you provide the recommendation, the recommendation is acted upon and change happens. You are not going to fold your arm and say, how do you measure success and wait for five years or six years for change to happen? We just also monitor people's change in terms of their talk, in terms of their thinking, in terms of debates, in terms of what's happening, you know. The debate is about poor customer service now. Next year, it's about, oh, things are happening, you know. I really like, you know, uh, how Rwanda is, you know, the tourism industry is doing, that kind of thing. Although you have not yet done an evaluation to actually show that things have changed empirically, you can tell that people's, you know, talks, thinking, are changing towards a positive thing that you, you know, you recommended. So we measure using various things. Success comes when something is no longer a problem and is forgotten as a problem. You think that's, I'm successful. Now, what has been the most significant, significant impact that you've had in your career to date? A person who drove this institution uh, from where it was with a very uh, negative attitude by donors and you know everybody and now being seen on the map and being credible and you know many people come to us the government believes in us the donors believe in us you know everybody's coming you know to seek advice so I think it's, it's really an impact mm -hmm. that, that I'm proud of. So if there's one thing that you could attribute your success to, what would it be? My taking responsibility, uh, when I took responsibility, I knew uh, that I had to do it. I had to do it and I'm empowered, you know. The thing is that when I took responsibility, I felt empowered. And when I am empowered, people think I can do it. And so I said, let me go do it. So it's about determination and willingness. I was very willing. I liked the job. So what is the most challenging aspect of your career? It's, it's getting the best researchers in this country. I think it's something that keeps me awake at night. How do I get the best? How do I retain them? How do I nurture them? That's something I'm working on every day. How do I get the best? How do I retain them and attract them to, to remain here? How do I nurture them to become, to continue to become the best? Let's explore those three things, because I think those are three very important leadership challenges. Yeah. So what are you doing to first draw the best researchers to you? Of course, we advertise nationally and internationally. I'm very, very keen in who I bring here. We have advertised many times. Sometimes we don't see who we want, according to that. We re-advertise again. And what we've gone for is not for very experienced uh, people who have published, no. 
we just go for young, enthusiastic, willing, good you know, researchers who are saying, look here, we've got a first class, we've got, you know, what we want is experience and nurturing, and this has worked. So we bring those young ones and, and try to, 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 to build their capacity. Mm -hmm. So that is working. And then bring one or two international high-profile researchers and give them a mandate of building the capacity of these. And in two years, you know, these are doing very well. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you retain? Retaining them is, of course, building uh, processes internally and externally. And that's one thing I said, which I think I'm, I'm proud of. Trying, actually money, fund money is, is, is giving them enough money is not enough to retain them. So you need to have relationship, to, you need to make them confident, you need to empower them that they can do things and you know, show them that actually what they are doing here is a career development so that they see themselves as part of the, the institution. They understand the vision, they understand the mission, they are part of the problem, you know, that comes up. They like that. And, you know, also try, of course, to give them a competitive salary that they're worth and make sure you, 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 you keep, you know, engaging them, interacting with them, understanding their needs and all that. That's something ongoing and, and, and challenging as well, but, you know, it's working and it's everywhere. And very important leadership strategies is making them understand the vision and taking hold of that vision, but understanding what their place in the organization yes. is. Is there anything else that you do in regards to empowering them? We actually also uh, make sure that they visit, you know, other international organizations. They present and they make sure we, they do write-ups for them. We have many things in place, small strategies in place, for example. You write your own work and then the mentor will look at it. Go out, interview people. When the mentor is looking, produce your own work. Go out there, present the work to stakeholders. Before they present, we go in the boardroom and they rehearse. And when they get there, they are stars. Yeah, the problem is when they become good, you know, they are taken. But we, we take it as success. Yeah. Now, what is the most significant decision that you've made in your career? I, I was doing a PhD uh, when I was, uh, you know, at, at KIST. And then I said, okay, uh, how, how best um, do I do this? But also, how best do I make my work? you know, work, because as I said, I was doing research and nothing was. So I said, look here, I, I think I could, I can start, you can go to work at IPA and then still continue. So with, 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 with my PhD. And then when I came here, I, the, the PhD was slow, but I'm proud of what I achieved here because I could not imagine myself, you know, starting this kind of organization where I had never started an organization. So that kind of living uh, my academic life and coming here, I think it was, it was very significant change. What would have been the biggest obstacle to get to this point in your career and how did you overcome it? It would have been really not having an opportunity to, to go to school. For my master's, for instance, I think my master's changed a lot in me. Uh, so I think when I went for my master's, I saw things in a broader way. And I wanted, you know, to go broad and not to remain where I am. So that made me think, think wider and change. So I think that, 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 that was important. So the, sort of the biggest challenge is not seeing broad, but your master's helped you overcome that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is what I call my edginess segment. The thing that makes you uncomfortable. You have to push the edge of your comfort zone. But you need to do it in order to achieve the success you have today. As we talk now, I realize that uh, we had, for instance, uh, researchers here. I'm a people person. I had a very good relationship with all my staff. 
but they were not delivering. One of them was not delivering. And I had to get rid of that person because they are supposed to be senior, okay? And it was very unfortunate. I really felt very bad. Even taking the decision to my board, I felt bad. But I, you know, fired two staff members who were not delivering. One after another, you know, one after one year, another after two years. It was something that made me very uncomfortable. But after that, you know, there was this kind of, you know, change in the organization. I never realized that the young researchers who are being mentored would see it as a motivation. I really didn't, you know, know. But they became motivated and it's okay. So I, I also got probably uh, an information in myself that actually firmness, firmness and, you know, taking a decision matters even for the people who are remaining. I think that's a huge uh, leadership learning too because also what could have happened is if those young people didn't think the senior people were performing and they noticed, they yeah. also were questioning why you haven't noticed and done something about it. Exactly. <laughs> so there's a lot of implications exactly. of keeping, uh, I'm going to say dead weight, I don't yes, know if yes, you, you know yes. what I mean by that, yeah. in, in your organization. Yeah. You also mentioned one earlier that I, I do, do want to mention, because yeah. I think it is also an important yeah. one, yeah. is when you had to, when you started the organization, and you really didn't have a lot of knowledge about IPR, yeah. and you had to speak about it. Yes, there was, um, I was two, two weeks, uh, old and the chair of the board said, um, Antonia, you have an interview on Fresh uh, Radio 10. You can't talk about IPA, you know. Oh my God, I had fear. I did not know what to do, so I had to read more and more and more. I had only read when I was going to do the interview here yeah, to understand the organization. So I started imagining, you know, what people would ask me. And I knew that IPA had a very negative, you know, kind of, uh, people knew it badly because it had been there for ages and it wasn't doing anything. And here I was going to answer for that. But what I learned afterwards that people were positive, but people wanted IPA to come. And also, it taught me always to take responsibility and not to blame others. So, not to blame the past, say, look here, you can start it, you've been given responsibility, take the responsibility, and don't blame others. And that's a big lesson that I learned. Whether something has been spoiled in the past by somebody, once you have the opportunity, make a difference. That's what I learned, and you can make it. Because mm. people didn't see me when I was on air as the person who had done it. They didn't even care about that. They just wanted to know what we are going to do to make a difference. To your point, with the past, you mean if it was successful, you may not have been in that position. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. What does success mean to you? Success is an achievement that makes you, you know, very happy and feel good, but it's not, sometimes you don't go through comfort. It's not it's not comfortable when you're going through it, you know, you, you get it after. So success is when you, 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 you feel that happiness of thing, of your vision being realized or your things happening, what you've been dreaming at is happening. And, but most importantly, when it, you know, it has changed something in society, when others see it rather than you seeing it, and this is what I've realized here, people see success here, and mention it and congratulate us, even when we have not realized that it is success, you know. And then we say, oh, okay. So it has, when other people are changed positively or affected positively because of what you're doing, I, I think that's, that's what success is. So how would you define leadership? Leadership is uh, having the ability to uh, be able to, be, to inspire, and, you know, have people follow or learn from what you're doing and also towards a certain direction 
that is defined by many, not only you. So it's it's kind of, you know it's um, something that you do with others, but you take the lead. And so, what three leadership lessons that you've acquired that you'd like to advise to others managing a project or leading a team? People should not think that people who are in, in leadership positions, great leaders, are very comfortable. No, they have to work for it. So it's not a comfort zone. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, something you do, probably enjoy it, but make with challenges. But it's, it's not comfortable. But you realize the comfort later. You must realize the comfort. The other thing is that uh, we can only realize our potential in leadership when we try. You know, you cannot know what you know until you try it. And every person has something good in them. But also, what I have lead, learned is that uh, there's a lot of training in leadership. You know, you learn every day and you solve things as challenges come. So I've enjoyed this learning, really, really. Every day I learn about something new and it's from the challenge that I learn and I enjoy it. What kind of words of wisdom would you give to your uh, girl child in this day and age in Rwanda? I'll, I'll tell her to, to to feel her worth, to know that she's worthwhile and she has the potential. And take every single opportunity that comes up and she'll be surprised what she has in her. Yeah. Now what do you wish you were told at 10 years old? Just imagine when I was 10 years old, I would uh, say, look here, uh, you'll be a great woman. Is there anything that you would change so far in your progression of life or career? Yeah, in terms of attitude, I think uh, I've come, I've become a more positive person, very positive. I look at everything in a positive way. Even when it is challenging, I know there's always something good in it. Uh, I look at people as you know whether they have different um, opinions with me as there's a reason, and a reason for me to even think further, to be able to, to learn from what they're saying. So I think being more positive, and also uh, you know, knowing that challenges are not as bad as I thought. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting, being a researcher, there is a general tendency to be more negative because you're that's the nature of looking for problems. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, yes. so it's hard. So it's amazing that, that you've yeah. recognized doing yeah, that. Yeah. So what words of wisdom would you have for African women? I think as I said, I think an African woman should know her worth, embrace it, and try it. There's always an opportunity. And they will know actually. They will be surprised what they have here. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for sharing with us. Well, another inspiring interview with some good insight, not only on managing staff, how to research, but take that research information, and a lot of that can apply to your organizations, and how to take it to the next level. Controlling expectations, not bringing surprises to your clients, they'll appreciate it. Again, my name is Suzanne S. Stevens, and I co-produce Wisdom Exchange TV alongside my husband, Michael K. Ginra. We're traveling all over Africa with backpacks, interviewing women leaders like the women we interviewed today. If you know a woman that's a pioneer, a trailblazer, or a leader of many, if you could give us her name, either on our fan page, Wisdom Exchange TV on Facebook, or email us at info at wisdomexchangetv.com with their name and what they've accomplished, and then we'll do our due diligence to find out if they meet the criteria that we interview. And finally, I want to leave you with my words of wisdom. We were talking a lot at the end there about leadership and taking risks, and really Ignite Excellence Group of Initiatives falls very in line with what the inspiration that we received today, and that is pushing the edge of your comfort zone to your personal and professional potential, because if you don't push the edge, you'll never, ever find out what you're capable of, and therefore not see an enhanced version of yourself. At Ignite Excellence, we call that edginess. Thank you for joining us.